staying on with news from India. More than 200 Indian farmers unions are set to hold a mega protest on the 13th of February. They are calling it Delhi Chalo. Thousands of farmers are on their way to the national capital. They are coming in from the breadbasket states of Punjab and Haryana, also from Uttar Pradesh. Now, what do these farmers want? Why are they protesting? What are the authorities doing in response? Let me answer all of those questions. Let's begin with what's happening on the ground. Section 144 has been imposed in the national capital. It will be in place till the 12th of March. This prohibits rallies and processions. Any gathering of five or more people is not allowed. Entry of tractors and trolleys or any vehicle transporting people or raw materials into Delhi is also prohibited. There is also a ban on firearms, explosives, corrosive substances or lethal weapons and on the carrying of brick bats, boulders, acid or any other dangerous fluid. Mobile internet services have been suspended in at least seven districts of Haryana from February 11 through February 13. There is also a ban on bulk messaging and all dongle services provided on mobile networks except voice calls. Security has been tightened in Delhi. Delhi police is on high alert. The national capital stands fortified. Borders have been sealed. Roads leading to Delhi have been blocked with cement barricades, barbed wires, iron nails. And it's not just the Delhi borders. Haryana and Punjab borders also stand blocked by cement slabs and multi-layered concrete walls. The Haryana police made makeshift prisons in several cities bordering Punjab. They also carried out a mock drill by firing water cannons and tear gas. But why is all this happening? What are the farmers of India demanding? To begin with, the farmers want a law guaranteeing minimum support price for all crops. It is the amount paid to the farmers when the government buys their produce. It's basically a safety net against any sharp fall in the crop prices. And they also want a complete waiver on the repayment of agricultural loans. On what grounds? The president of the Sugar Cane Cultivators Association says, for the last three years, Farmers have been in distress either due to floods or drought. They have suffered crop loss and financial stress. So the farmers want their debt to be waived off. And then they have called for higher import duties on agricultural commodities, milk products, fruits, vegetables and more. They want India to withdraw from the World Trade Organization and impose a ban on all free trade agreements. Other than that, there are demands for a pension scheme and over 200 days of employment. And lastly, the farmers want the pending demands of the previous protests to be fulfilled. And what is the government's response? What are the authorities doing about it? A team of union ministers has started talks in Chandigarh with the farmer leaders. This includes the Food and Consumer Affairs Minister and the Agriculture Minister. They are trying to dissuade them from this march. This is their second round of talks. Will they be successful? As of now, the convoy of farmers near the borders is only getting bigger. It is election season in India. The ruling Bharatiya Janata Party seems well placed to win a third term. The Congress, meanwhile, has its back against the wall. And amid that, Rahul Gandhi has chosen to hit the streets a second time. Now, does the Congress think the steps will translate into votes? Then it might need to rethink that. The walk, after all, began with a bang, but it looks like it will end with a whimper. After last year's Bharat Jodo Yatra, or Unite India March, Rahul Gandhi is leading another road trip. This one is called the Bharat Joro Nyay Yatra. For our global audience, Nyay means justice. The theme of the second edition of this journey is justice. The journey began on the 14th of January from Manipur and it was scheduled to conclude on the 20th of March in Mumbai, but it now may come to an end at least a week earlier than planned. And why is that? Well, because the Congress had decided, has decided to skip most of the western districts in the state of Uttar Pradesh. 
The Yatra was scheduled to enter the state this week. Rahul Gandhi was supposed to spend 11 days in Uttar Pradesh. It is a politically crucial state. 80 Lok Sabha seats are at stake, even more so for the Congress, because it has failed to make a mark here in the last two lower house elections. And it seems to be on the same path this time around as well. Rahul Gandhi's uh, yatra was uh, to pass through 28 constituencies. This included Prime Minister Narendra Modi's seat, Varanasi, Raibareli, Amneti, Allahabad, Fulpur, and Lucknow. But now, according to reports, the journey would skip most of the western UP in districts. It will travel directly from Lucknow to Aligarh and then to Agra before entering Madhya Pradesh. Why has Rahul Gandhi decided to leave Western Uttar Pradesh out of his itinerary? Has the Congress given up hope or is it trying to save face? Because interestingly, there are reports that Congress's India bloc partner, Rashtriya Lok Dal, which has a strong presence in Western UP, has now joined hands with the National Democratic Alliance. You see, something similar happened last month as well when the Bharat Jodo Nyayatra was about to enter the state of Bihar. Chief Minister Nitish Kumar of the JDU refused to be a part of it. He was an ally, he was an ally of the opposition bloc at that time. But shortly after this snub, he also switched loyalty to the National Democratic Alliance, the NDA. Now, is the same going to happen in Western UP as well. Is that why the Congress has decided to save its breath and exclude the constituencies from the journey? Sources close to the Congress are saying otherwise. They have said that the decision was nothing, has nothing to do with the political developments. But what is the reason then? Apparently, the Congress wants to slow down the Yatra. It wants to ensure that Rahul Gandhi gets more time to interact with groups on the way. Now, it's up to you if you want to buy that. But the truth of the matter is, the desperation in the Congress camp is growing loud. Many leaders who are perceived to be close to Rahul Gandhi have already quit. So have some old timers. The two Yatras and Rahul's Mass Connect programs were supposed to help the Congress revive its fortunes, but will they actually do that? Is the million dollar question here. The journey is ill-timed and seems to be more harm than good for Rahul Gandhi and his party. Analysts saying such Yatras are good PR, they are meant to bring electoral benefits, but in the case of the Bharat Jodo Nyayatra, the reverse is happening. The India bloc is slowly collapsing. The Janata Dal United has snapped ties. The Trinamool Congress and the Amati Party decided to contest alone. In another setback to the alliance, the Rashtra Lok Dal also ditched it for the NDA. And Rahul Gandhi's long absence from the national capital just ahead of the elections is not going to help. Our next story is about a blast from the past. A comeback that no one wants. And by the past, by the way, I mean way back in the past, the 14th century to be precise. Have you heard of the bubonic plague? Well, it wreaked havoc in Europe in the 14th century. So why am I talking about it tonight? Well, because it's back. Where? In the United States. Oregon has reported its first human case of bubonic plague in over eight years. This is a scary development and tonight we will tell you all that you need to know. But first things first, what exactly is bubonic plague? It is an infectious disease and how does it spread? It spreads mostly to human beings through infected fleas that travel on rodents. Symptoms include high fever and swollen lymph nodes or buboes. That's where the disease gets its name from. In fact, the Black Death is used to refer to a bubonic plague pandemic that hit Europe and killed millions of Europeans in the 14th century. It was, in fact, one of the most fatal pandemics ever. And now in the United States and across the world, the bubonic plague is making headlines all over again. In Oregon, a local resident got effect infected. How did that happen? It has been suggested that the individual that the disease, uh, uh, th it has been su suggested that the uh, disease most likely got transmis transmitted to the individual from a pet cat. 
the cat was showing symptoms. Basically, pet animals can contract the infection through infected fleas or by hunting rodents that might have been bitten by an infected flea. The disease can then jump to human beings. According to officials, the resident and the cat have got medical attention. All close contacts of the resident and the pet have been contacted and given medication to prevent illness. Officials have said there is no risk to the community thanks to the early diagnosis and treatment. You see, that's the key. Antibiotics can help treat the disease in case of early detection, but if untreated, the disease can be fatal. Oregon's last tryst with the bubonic plague was back in the year 2015. A teenage girl got the disease because of a flea bite. This happened while she was on a hunting expedition. The disease is exceedingly rare. Oregon itself has seen only nine human cases of the plague since the year 1995. And how common is the disease in the United States? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention noting that an annual average of 5 to 15 cases in the Western United States. So as of now, there is no reason for alarm. Things are under control and we will be monitoring the developments very closely. So watch this space.